Wow. Okay. Great. Um, all right, Dan Diane, go ahead. Okay. The Tikkun Olam Committee is excited about our Mitzvah Times 2 fundraiser. Order dinner from Kurt's Cafe on June 3rd with proceeds being donated to Magin David Dome, Israel's National Ambulance, Blood Service, and Disaster Relief Organization. Kurtz improves outcomes for young adults living in at-risk situations through work and life skills training. The Human Needs Committee is also making a generous donation to Magon, Magain Dovida Dome. The order form for ordering dinner for June 3rd can be found on the Macomb at home. So after tonight, today's session, place your orders and thank you for your support. Thanks, Diane and the whole Tikkun Olam Committee. And uh, I turn it over to Jim to introduce our speaker today. Well, good morning and, and welcome everybody. Uh, I'm here, well, I'm here to hear it, but I'm here to introduce uh, Kiel Mayeski, who uh, Kiel and his family currently live in the Twin Cities area, which of course is, is a big part of what he's talking about. Uh, family includes one, one child now, and hopefully the uh, number two will at least wait till this afternoon to put in an appearance <laughs> so that we get through the next hour. Um, I met Keel years ago when he was executive director of the Candles Holocaust Museum in Terre Haute. Uh, he has also worked, as, well, he's a public historian who has mentored youth, he's curated exhibits, uh, participated and moderated various uh, forums and presentations internationally, uh, led tours of genocide memorials in North America, Europe, Africa, and is the founder of Timberwolf Advisors, which is a consultancy that he named for his grandfather's U.S. Army unit, the 104th Infantry Division. Uh, you, 100, I'll get it yet. The 104th Infantry Division, who were known as the Timberwolves, and among other things, uh, during World War II, were involved in the liberation of the Dora Middlebow concentration camp. Uh, Keel has worked as, with Timberwolf for a variety of organizations like Together We Remember, uh, with Carl Wilkins in his Walk a Mile in My Shoes group, and just in the last couple of weeks became the executive director of the Florence and Lawrence uh, Spungen Family Foundation. So Keel has been involved in a whole variety of different things, all of them centered around social action and awareness and understanding and communication with people. And on that note, Keel, I'll let you do your thing. Thank you, Jim. Can you uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Good, good. Um, yes, uh, thank you for that introduction, Jim. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Macomb Salel, for this uh, opportunity to meet with you and um, for this great series that you run. Uh, I want to um, invite you all to ask questions along the way. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. Um, and then we'll reserve a little bit of time at the end for questions and answers too. So um, I'm just gonna start sharing my screen and we'll see if we can uh, do this right. Okay, uh, so if my calculations are correct, here we are at Macomb Solel in Highland Park, right? Okay, and um, we're gonna take a trip to 38th and Chicago Avenue in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. So here we go, just a hop, skip and a jump. And uh, one thing to note here is that this is um, south of downtown Minneapolis. You know, I'm, I'm here, I've got uh, my mother-in-law's cousin staying with us and I took him down to 38th in Chicago um, on Friday. And uh, he thought, you know, being from San Diego, that this happened right in the middle of downtown Minneapolis, but, but it didn't. This is a neighborhood in South Minneapolis. You can see we're maybe three, four miles from the city center there. Um, so that's where we're talking about right here at 38th and Chicago Avenue. And now I'm gonna um, go on to my PowerPoint slides here. Uh, and, um, the way that uh, I've organized the talk is that we'll do a virtual tour of George Floyd Square, uh, and then we'll try to link that to some of the history, the centuries-long history that this is connected to. I've probably got too much history in there, so we might have to fly through that part. 
Um, then I'll offer some uh, practical thoughts from my experience in navigating the complex realm of allyship as you know me, a, a straight white man, um, and you know most of the people on this call I think probably identify or are seen as white and what is the role for us in bringing about more racial justice? What are some of the challenges involved? And then time for Q&A. But as I said, feel free to ask questions all along the way. Um, so. Um, I'll also say, Kiel, that uh, I can't always see you if you're raising your hand. The best thing would be to chat uh, the question and then I can, um, Kiel doesn't have to watch it, I'll watch it. Okay, thanks, Vanessa. And yeah, Vanessa, feel free to jump in and put the brakes on anytime if you see a question come up. So here we are at the intersection of 38th and Chicago Avenues. You can see that it's barricaded and this barricade started uh, probably a week after uh, the murder of George Floyd. Um, this is a no-go zone for police and ambulances and first responders. It's uh, community control of this intersection. Um, and that stems from the relationship of mistrust between the community and the police and, and other institutions. So this is the free state of George Floyd. And when you come into the intersection, you gotta meet the gatekeeper. This is Eliza Wesley. She's from uh, Mississippi originally, but she's been in uh, Minneapolis for the last couple decades. And uh, she first came out to um, what's now called George Floyd Memorial Square the day after his murder. Um, she's a religious woman, she's a pastor, and she felt called by God to come out here and serve, see what the needs were. And um, I've got a little vid video here from CARE 11, uh, one of the local news affiliates, uh, where you can hear some of what Eliza has to say. So uh, actually, I think I need to share my computer audio. So I'll stop sharing and reshare. Okay. Good. So that should work. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and play it. And uh, Vanessa, just wave your hands if you can't hear anything, okay? For a space to maintain, any space, it needs to be taken care of. Welcome to the George Floyd Memorial. It needs caretakers. This got to stay here. On the north side of the memorial space at 38th in Chicago. Yes, I watch everything to come in. Eliza Wesley is taken care. Going, however, by a given name. I am the gatekeeper. That's who I am. I'm the gatekeeper out here on 37th Street and Chicago Avenue. For more than 100 days in a row now, she womans her post. I'm out here so that people can feel safe, people can feel comfortable when they come here. But why? Why her? This is what happened. I was at home and I asked the Lord, what did he want me to do? She said she asked that in prayer back in May and the days after George Floyd died. And she said the answer was to come here. When I got down here, I seen it was chaotic. Nobody knew who I was. I just got out of my car and the, the streets was messed up, all type of cars was coming in and stuff, and I got out and controlled traffic. And so for days after, Go around. she kept coming. Go around the third night to come back around. And in time, her role would become known. Mrs. Eliza, she's the gatekeeper. She's the voice out here. So she's here every day of the week. She works hard, seven days a week since this started. How y'all doing today? She never gave it a break yet. Sir, you got a mask? God chose her and he chose the right one. So nowadays, as folks come from all over the state, all over the country, for any given reason, she welcomes them. We want this to be a place where people can always come here and have a memorial for George Floyd. Who's welcome to come here? All is welcome. Red, white, blue, green, and purple don't make a difference. We all is welcome. We're in this thing together. Wow. Where you guys want? The gatekeeper's rules are simple. Yeah. Be respectful, clean your hands, and wear a mask. And while she's been the self-appointed enforcer of that at her entry, she knows at the exact same time the city is trying to figure out what this space should be long term. Her ask is, while those are having that conversation, to listen to what people like her who have volunteered down here for no pay for more than three months, have to say. This space is secured. It's bigger than what people think that is. Stop looking and come down here and see what's going on. Don't talk about it, be about it. Everybody's talking about it, but nobody's coming down here. Many regular people do come down here, and if they come by way of 37th and Chicago, they meet the gatekeeper. Welcome to the free state of George Flora. And from behind her mask, she smiles and directs. Say their names is down there. Over 
and over and over. 106 days and counting. Every morning I get up, I rise. This is another day that I'm going out here for our people. I'm not going to stop. I ask God to give me strength, and God been giving me strength. Welcome to the George Floyd Memorial. So in terms of the city and those leaders, they are talking and meeting, like I said, to determine the best way forward for that intersection. No timeline has been set for a decision, I was told. And in a statement they gave me today, the city said it is committed to taking action to support and invest in racial justice and healing at 38th and Chicago and the entire area. If you're interested in seeing specifics on what the city is saying, it has an entire website devoted to that conversation. If you want to check it out, I put it on my Facebook page. And if you don't use that site, I get it. Just shoot me a personal email and I'll send it back to you. Be right back. So at the time that that um, piece was done, you know, that was maybe three months after the murder of George Floyd and Eliza is still there every day. Uh, she missed two or three weeks um, in this past March uh, when her mother died and she went back to Mississippi to bury her. Uh, but she's still out there every day. She's an unpaid volunteer, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, because this is what she feels called to do. Uh, and she reflects the, the village mindset that surrounds and cares for George Floyd Memorial Square. You can see here, I've got a couple signs just to orient us, um, where it's, it's establishing that this is basically tended to by community volunteers from all walks of life and to please be respectful. Um, and this is the real key piece here. And, and some of this um, you know, could be upsetting to you, some of the, the language that's used. Um, but I think it's really important that we listen uh, because this is uh, a space that is controlled uh, by Black people for the purpose of uh, Black grief and Black peace, justice, healing, and joy. And um, for people, Black people in America, as far as I'm understanding it, um, <clears throat> you know, this is, this type of site is ground zero for interpreting the entire history of uh, black life in America, oppression, racism, segregation, slavery, all these sorts of things. And so you can see here in this middle column, um, the person who wrote this uh, orientation brochure for the site is suggesting that we think of it as a Vietnam Veterans Memorial or like visiting Auschwitz. And that can be hard for some of us to hear, but this is, this is what we need to hear. Uh, without judgment, um, at least suspending that and without comparison, um, but connections can be made, parallels can be made, and there are pitfalls when we make those parallels too. So most of the people who visit George Floyd Square seem to be white people, and so most of the language is geared toward helping white people understand how they can be helpful in these sorts of situations. Uh, you know, it's saying black pain is on display here, and so here are some uh, tips uh, ways that you can help um, be part of the uh, solution instead of part of the problem, which is committing to being anti-racist, beginning to work to educate yourself and your immediate family, thinking about uh, analyzing your thoughts, ways of engagement, uh, and the power that we carry as white people, decentralizing our feelings and prioritizing thoughts, stories, and leadership of BIPOC folks, and BIPOC is a term not without controversy that stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Um, so, uh, and then the last is working to create systemic change. Um, so, you know, there are warnings of uh, like notifying neighbors, neighborhood leaders of suspicious activity. Just last week, there was a person who came to George Floyd Square with an ax and destroyed uh, one of the, um, the gatekeeper stations. Uh, there have been people who come to deface the murals. Um, and again, this is a no-go zone for police. So it's all, you know, community organized surveillance and security. There are multiple sites at the memorial uh, and we'll look at all of them, uh, including the Memorial Cemetery, Say Their Names Memorial, the actual site uh, where George Floyd was murdered. Um, and then here, this, this fist in the middle of the intersection, we'll see that as well. Um, but this is a place, well, we'll just come to it. So this is the Say Their Names Memorial and this uh, entire street, this is, uh, I guess this would be Chicago Avenue, 
um, from 37th all the way up to 38th, which has uh, painted on it the names of uh, victims of police violence in the US um, recently. We're not talking about the, the 50s or, or 40s or anything like that. This is in the last 10 years or so. Um, and what I thought was important from this uh, artist's statement is uh, that she says, um, she, many people have reached out to her to ask to add the names of their fathers, brothers, sons, and friends to the list. And some have traveled from out of state to see their loved ones honored there. And this reminds me of my work with um, survivors of genocide who have participated in commemorations with me and organizations that I've worked with. And sometimes we lay out a wall or a banner where they can write or say the names of their loved ones. And many people will say, this is the first time um, since my loved one was taken from me that I have spoken their name out loud or that I have written their name or acknowledged that they are no longer here with me. It was, a, as you can imagine, a very cathartic and powerful and important experience. Um, as Michael Berenbaum says, bringing presence to the absence. Uh, so, here we are at the intersection of 38th and Chicago, and you can see they've. This is like a semi-official sign here in the in the same font as the Parks Department, naming it George Floyd Square, but it's hand painted. Um, and in each of these photos, we could spend minutes looking at little bits and pieces, uh, you know, forensically analyzing them. What does this mean? Why is this here? For example, you'll see the picture of Ahmed Arbery here. You'll see Amanda Gorman, the the um, poet laureate. Uh, who uh, powerfully spoke at the inauguration of Joe Biden. Um, and this is, you'll probably recognize if you've seen the video, I myself have not watched the video and I'm um, happy to talk about that, but you'll probably recognize the cup food sign. Uh, so uh, Mr. Floyd was murdered right outside the front entrance, um, just about where this lady in the salmon colored shirt is standing. Uh, and Cup Foods is still open for business. Uh, it was closed for a while and it's still open. You can go in there and buy a, you know, slushy or whatever. And their business is all along here struggling with uh, staying open, um, you know, even though vehicles can't access it. And this is one of the big reasons why there's this tension between the city and the community because the city wants to open up the intersection. And they keep saying every so often, okay, after this, you know, in August, after the trial of Chauvin, whatever, we're going to open it back up. And the community is saying, without meeting our demands for justice, we are not removing these barricades. So it's a bit of a standoff. Um, one thing that I think is powerful up here in the billboard above uh, the Cup Foods building is, is this sign. Um, you probably know that George Floyd, with one of his last breaths, was calling out and saying, Mama. And the sign is saying, all mothers were summoned when George Floyd called out for his mama, which I think is a, a powerful cross-cutting uh, identity to unite people for racial justice, mothers, you know, so many mothers out there who share such a, a special bond. And now we're getting closer to the site where um, Floyd was killed. Um, it's, it's right down here surrounded by the orange cones um, with a, you know, iconic mural of George Floyd right beside it. Um, and then here is the actual site where somebody has painted the, the outline of a figure and people leave offerings, candles, all sorts of things that mean something to them or that they think meant something to him. Um, another look at it, it's uh, oftentimes, so as soon as it starts raining like this weekend, uh, this mural volunteers will come out and cover the mural, which is painted on plywood in a uh, tarp so it doesn't get damaged. Um, and they'll pop up this tent here to keep all the, the flowers and memorials that people have left uh, safe from the elements as well. Um, so here's just a little 20 seconds or something, a, a little live, not live, but uh, video view of the space. Um, closer look at the the mural and with everything there's contention so there's there's this mural and if I went back a few um, you'll see probably what's an even more iconic mural of George Floyd that's in the newspaper stories all over the world um, and that was actually painted by white people so this 
this mural here painted by a black artist is preferred to the community rather than the one on the side of the building which was painted by white people under the auspices of a person of color but uh, still done by white people and these are some of the very nuanced types of uh, complexities with allyship that I referred to previously. Just across the street, it's a speedway gas station that's no longer a speedway, it's the people's way, as you can see from the signage. Um, and under the awning there, uh, there are benches, people bring firewood during the winter. Um, there's uh, snacks, meals, bottled water, whatever for um, the volunteers who are working that day. Uh, and it's right outside a, a bus stop that's no longer functioning. Um, because this is a no-go zone for the city. Um, and I think this is uh, apt, uh, you know, humorous in a way that uh, where the city put up a sign that says buses do not stop here, the communities put up a sign that says, please board the revolution here. Um, the sign uh, for, yeah, go ahead, Vanessa. Um, first of all, Rabbi Serrata said that uh, seeing all the names reminds him of the AIDS quilt, and certainly some of the names were not mentioned until they were on the quilt. And um, Danny Spungen said that he, um, I think he came here with you, and that he made sure to spend some money in the area and had a good lunch, and I'm sure that's very important to keep that community to sustain them. Yeah, absolutely. And it's um, one of those things where uh, the community, you know, hopefully recognizes that we're all in this together sort of thing, because if the businesses start going against the activists and saying, look, we've got to open the intersection to get our, uh, you know, businesses to survive and all that sort of thing, then things fall apart and things are always in danger of falling apart. So it helps to have people like Danny come and spend money at just uh, at, uh, I think the place is called Just Turkey, right, Danny? Uh, and they literally sell just uh, turkey and, and it was a good lunch. Um, so the sign outside, oh, and uh, Rabbi Serrata, yeah, thank you for mentioning that. You know, it's <clears throat> uh, interesting that you mention it because um, I, as I said, I just visited with uh, my mother-in-law's cousin who's a gay man from San Diego and that was his first reaction too, is this reminded him, the names on the street reminded him of the AIDS quilt back in the 90s. Um, the sign outside the people's way changes frequently. And uh, so the sign um, currently reads, I just took this on Friday, read the demands. We'll get into that. One down, three to go. One down referring to Derek Chauvin, three referring to the other officers, former officers who were standing by while he committed the murder. No justice, no streets. This is a play on the phrase, no justice, no peace. And what it means is basically until the demands for justice are met, we're not removing the barricades. So the city doesn't get the street back. Uh, what demands are they talking about? Here are 24 demands on plywood boards. So I think it's important for any uh, justice movement to have uh, demands. I think there was a, a rather well-known incident when Black Lives Matter activists were um, interrupting speeches from presidential candidates back in 2016. And uh, Hillary Clinton was about to take the stage she was aware that the activists were going to interrupt her speech. She brought them backstage and said, I'm listening, what do you want? And like, what are, what are your demands? How can I help? And there was a little bit of trouble articulating a clear platform. Um, and from that sprung uh, a lot of things like the, the policy platform of the movement for black lives, which whether you agree with it or disagree with it is a pretty ideal um, way of articulating your platform. So here we have 24 demands on the plywood boards. Here's one giving some of the backstory about how this site came to be. We're not gonna read it right now, but another uh, example that I immediately thought of um, when we're talking about plywood boards uh, and list of demands. Does anybody recognize this guy in this scene? This is uh, Lech Wałęsa, the uh, former president of Poland and a uh, Nobel laureate who before that was a shipyard worker in Gdańsk and organized the solidarity movement. Um, and the Solidarność political party, which became massively popular and influential in uh, overthrowing, perhaps that's not the right word, but getting rid of the communist regime in Poland. And uh, this is from the Solidarity Museum in Gdańsk when I was there a few years ago, there are 21 demands, which were on plywood boards. And this reflects kind of the proletariat sensibilities of, of both of these movements. Uh, and here it's, you know, talking about what some of those demands were. 
Um, so what are the demands of uh, George Floyd Village? Uh, it all boils down to no justice, no streets. They hand out postcards that have all 24 demands on them. A lot of them have to do with very specific items about accountability for um, Bureau of Criminal Apprehension employees whom they want fired, uh, transparency and accountability in particular cases, names you may remember, such as Philando Castile, who was killed by police in 2016, George Floyd and others, Jamar Clark, establishing certain uh, independent investigative bodies, um, investing grant dollars into the George Floyd Square Zone uh, and training um, capacity building for the people doing the work. Um, and it's got included some, uh, some investment dollars for the local businesses, facade improvements and so forth. And I'm happy to share all these resources with you after the presentation, but I think it's we important have, uh, to have this. We have one um, question uh, from Jim. I know that we all watched as uh, the trial of Chauvin. How does the community reacting to the postponement of the other three officers? Um, the postponement specifically, I think it's, um, you know, people here, well, first of all, let me just say that it's, it's hard to understand unless you're here, the degree to which everybody in the Twin Cities area has, has taken this personally to some degree. And everybody has felt called to, you know, put a sign in their window or, or something, or in some way wrestle with what it means for them personally, because it affects so many people. Um, the postponement, um, I'll have to check on that, Jim, because I haven't heard any specific reactions to that. I know, you know, during the trial of Chauvin, there was a lot more activity around the square. And, um, you know, when the verdict was about to be announced, a huge crowd gathered. When it was announced, there was, it was an atmosphere like a, a celebration. Um, you know, Eliza Wesley, the gatekeeper herself said she never wanted to talk about the trial. Didn't, didn't want anybody to say a single word to her about it. Didn't watch any of it because for her, that trial is not the end all be all for justice and the demands for justice of, are of a higher order than, than what happens to one particular person. So here we are at the Say Their Names uh, Memorial Cemetery. Um, and these are all again, victims of um, police violence uh, from the last several years. A lot of these names you will probably recognize, many you will not. And I think that speaks to the, um, the degree to which, the frequency with which it happens and the degree to which it's normalized, that it's you know, kind of in the realm of mass shootings in America. You know, Some may have happened yesterday and, and we don't even hear about them anymore because it's just so common. So here's a walk through the Say Their Names Cemetery. You just observe some of the names, maybe you recognize some, maybe you don't recognize others. What are some of the other types of signage uh, you, you will see around George Floyd Square? So um, this I thought was fascinating because the ostensible purpose for the uh, police being called on George Floyd was his attempted passage of a counterfeit bill. And so here you have a bill, uh, you know, the United States currency with George Floyd's image on it. Um, this is, uh, if not us, then who, if not now, then when, attributed to John Lewis. I've also seen this attributed to uh, Emma Watson, Abe Lincoln, Mark Twain, everybody else under the sun. But uh, somebody help me out here. Is this not uh, rabbinic wisdom? I thought that was the original source of this. Can somebody speak to that? Yes, definitely rabbinic wisdom. Exactly. Um, 
Um, if I am not for myself, who, uh, who will be for me? Im ena nili mili. We have different songs to it. Uh, Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Sarat is here just to uh, make sure yeah, that. I'm right. <laughs> yeah, you got it right. So <laughs> if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If, uh, uh, if I'm for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so uh, there's a question of the day or an ask of the day. I think this is a, a good framing for dialogue. It says, ask questions, conversate with those you don't know, stop exchanging ignorance between you and those you came with. So step outside of your comfort zone and, and have an exchange. Easier said than done, I'm sure. Um, and it comes with some risk. We'll talk about that more later. Um, I took this picture because this, this inscription on the wall here my cries are for humanity that speaks to me uh you know i'm not black but the reason i'm involved is because i do think this is a human problem this is about breakdown of humanity and we all need to be invested in the in the answers and, and the change um here on the left you'll see a, a image of micaiah bryant who was um killed by police in ohio just weeks ago um, I'm interested to talk with you about that. I have some certain thoughts, but we'll keep it moving. And here in the middle, donate to Darnella Frazier's Peace and Healing Fund. Darnella Frazier was the young woman who uh, recorded the video of uh, Derek Floyd being murdered. And you can imagine the, um, and also testified in the trial. So you can imagine the weight that's on her shoulders having watched this man be killed by police. Um, I'm sure having threats hurled at her and, and her safety uh, in question all the time. So this is a, you know, grassroots campaign for, for her healing. Um, what about other people? Uh, you'll see probably a little closer view, Dante Wright, who was um, killed by police April 11th, just this year, uh, less than one year after um, the murder of George Floyd. This is in Brooklyn Center, um, another suburb about 20 minutes away from the intersection of 38th and Chicago here. And uh, so we went out, my family and I, we went out to that site as well. Um, so this is the site where uh, Dante Wright was killed. Um, you can see the same uh, congruent symbol here as in George Floyd Square, the, the black fist raised um, as a symbol of power. Uh, and then all of the action is taking place outside of the Brooklyn Center Police Department. So powerful symbol here uh, as Dante Wright was being pulled over. I think he was on the phone with his loved one and he said, I think I'm being pulled over because I have an air freshener hanging from my rear view mirror, which a lot of people don't know is not allowed in some municipalities. And so people come to this barricade that's been erected outside the Brooklyn Center Police Department and hang air fresheners. You can see that it's sort of like a militarized zone. There's a standoff between the community and uh, a militarized police force. You can see, you know, armed guards up here on top of the police department building with uh, guns trained on the crowd. Um, and uh, somebody's put up a sign that says stop state terror on the barricade. This is, this is what the issue is about for so many people in this community. You see a member of the pr uh, press uh, not wearing her helmet, but still otherwise dressed like uh, she's in a combat zone. Um, and the evening we were there, uh, the Reverend Jesse Jackson showed up and was followed around by a crowd of people. And so this is this is what's going on. Uh, back here, you'll see uh, there's a member of the police or a uh, press. Um, and some other things that I wanted to talk about because there's so many groups doing doing work around this area. One other group that I'm affiliated with is called Memorialize the Movement. I'm a guy who's fascinated by collective memory and the power of collective memory to be a springboard for action that brings um, reparative uh, justice and healing and peace to our societies. Uh, so just this weekend, there was a huge outdoor exhibit um, marking the one year anniversary of the murder of George Floyd called Justice for George, Messages from the People and Memorialize the Movement. Um, this is an article that was in the New York Times just a couple days ago about them. Uh, it was founded by this uh, young woman named Lisa Kelly, um, who took it upon herself to uh, go door to door to all these businesses that had plywood barricades. I'm sure you've seen them in Chicago uh, around their storefronts. And on those uh, mural, on those uh, plywood boards were painted murals um, and artistic activist statements by artists. And so Lisa went around um, collecting 
those boards, 800 of them so far, and there's still more to go. Now there's some, you know, having to do with the murder of Dante Wright and so forth. Uh, and so she's founded this organization called Memorialize the Movement that had this huge exhibit in the park, um, putting these boards on display. The boards are stored inside. So it's a huge curatorial and preservation project, um, and which is why I'm involved. And uh, so you can just see some of the, some of the symbols here, some of the murals. And for this section, I'm ending on um, this, this mural here, skin color is not reasonable suspicion because that is a segue into the historical linkage to how we got here in the first place. Um, why is this problem of police violence on black and brown people and low income people for that matter, such, such a problem, such a pervasive problem. And, uh, you know, some people say, uh, I think Mark Twain maybe said history doesn't rhyme, but it echo, history doesn't echo, but it rhymes. And so this is a slant rhyme having to do with my hometown of Terre Haute, Indiana, um, because just about the time that uh, George Floyd was killed last May, I was involved in a project and I'm still involved in a community remembrance project for a victim of racial terror lynching in my hometown, which happened February 26th, 1901. And so this man's name was George Ward, not George Floyd, but George Ward, which is a slant rhyme of uh, historical proportions. And um, I had been doing a lot of research at the public library and archives about this man named George Ward. And I heard about the killing of this man named George Floyd and I kept getting them mixed up in my head um, you know, when I meant to say George Floyd, I'd say George Ward and vice versa. Uh, and that in some way was fitting uh, and, and apt to me because there is a connection between the two. So this is the bridge over the Wabash River. Um, and at this span here, February 26, 1901, this black man, George Ward, was uh, hung from the bridge span um, while a crowd of some 3,000 people watched from the banks of the Wabash River. Um, and in fact, the, the bridge commissioner reported that there were so many people on that bridge that it sunk a few inches that day. Um, and here you can see uh, some of the headlines from the day. I would caution you that, uh, you know, to take these with a grain of salt because the pervasiveness of racism crept as well into the media. And so it was assumed that George Ward was guilty for the murder of a young Jewish school teacher named Ida Finkelstein. So here we are 120 years later and talk about um, a chance for bridge building between the local Jewish community and black community in my hometown of Terre Haute, Indiana of how they wrestle with the memory of the murder of a young Jewish woman and the lynching of a black man who is assumed to have killed her. Uh, so here uh, I found the statement from the rabbi at the time who makes the same mistake of assuming that, uh, you know, Ward committed the murder, but still spoke out against the lynching. And I'll read it in case, in case you can't see Rabbi Leipziger's uh, statement here at the um, funeral proceedings for Ida Finkelstein. He said, and he whose hands are stained with the crime, he is no more, he has paid the penalty, but let us who are of sober judgment repudiate and act that has all the weakness of impulsiveness and all the disgrace of impotency. Let us repudiate this act of violence, even in our thoughts. We would only desecrate the life of Ida Finkelstein if our love, our sympathy, or our respect led us to an impulsive deed. Let us repudiate that act of violence. One outrage does not justify another. Let her life, who lies cold before us, teach us patience and perseverance, and our own lives will be more and more like hers, hollowed before God. So there are a number of things that are interesting to me in this. Um, one outrage does not justify another. So when we hear about the police killing of black people in the United States, there's often a, a voice, you know, some people who say, well, if they weren't committing crimes, then they wouldn't be killed by police anyway. But that's not justice. That's not how justice is done in this country. Um, and even if they were committing crimes, it does not uh, justify summary execution by somebody who's not deputized to perform that sort of uh, work uh, in our streets. So um, we could say Rabbi Leipzinger's words uh, in response to some of these other acts of police killing that happened. So 
talking about this problem of lynching in America, um, this is something that I didn't know much about until I visited the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, which was established in 2018 in Montgomery, Alabama by the organization called Equal Justice Initiative, founded by the attorney Brian Stevenson. And, um, you know, it's the, the rabbi here was speaking out against this because lynching was so pervasive just in, in the same newspaper where I found this clipping, there were three other lynchings or about to be lynchings being reported on that day um, because this was what was happening in the Jim Crow era of America after um, slavery was abolished. So uh, EJI has done these reports on enslavement, lynching, uh, segregation um, and reconstruction in America. They're all on the website. They're all free. You can get them in hard copy for like two bucks. I've, I've read most of them and they really changed my life. I would just, they're so well documented and so powerful and so unknown to so many of us that I would really recommend um, that you go to EJI.org and find these reports. So let me summarize for you the report on lynching in America. What they found was that it was much more prevalent than previously reported. They documented 4,084 racial terror lynchings in 12 Southern states in a sp certain span of time, basically 50 years. And even since I put this presentation together, they found more. Um, so 300 of those were done in uh, other states, not in the South during the same time period, 18 in my home state of Indiana and 56 in the state of Illinois, which is the most of any Northern state. Um, and what is a racial terror lynching? So this is um, an extrajudicial judi execution carried out by a mob in broad daylight on the courthouse lawn, so to speak, with impunity. And that's the important connection here. It was a public and gruesome spectacle that was designed to traumatize and induce fear in the entire African-American population. Um, and it was, you know, some people have referred to it or, or tried to legitimize it as a form of frontier justice because justice systems didn't exist, but that's not true. We're, this is like 20th century United States of America when we had courts and everything in place that could have um, served justice uh, or that's, that's their purpose at least. It peaked between 1880 and 1940 and it really shaped uh, the geographic, political, economic, and social conditions for African-Americans in America in ways that are still evident today. It was used as a tactic for racial control, as I said, victimizing the entire African-American community. And it wasn't primarily used as a punishment for crime because as I said, those systems were already in place. Um, it was a type of terrorism. Uh, and, and the types of lynchings, uh, you know, a lot of them resulted from uh, fears of interracial sex, uh, you know, alleged social transgressions of speaking to a white woman, you know, thinking of Emmett Till or whistling at a white woman and so forth. Um, you know, a lot of times, just, just like today, there are allegations that this person who was killed by police had committed a crime and therefore it's somehow justified. This was also the same justification used for racial terror lynchings back in the day. Um, they were public spectacles drawing people out in a carnival-like atmosphere um, George Ward, the man I was talking about earlier, um, and sorry for this, but um, you know, at the end, um, there were adults who were calling out to kids in the crowd that they would pay a couple dollars uh, if the kids would go cut off a, a finger or toe of Ward as a souvenir. And even the local newspaper sold photographs as the lynching of the lynching as souvenirs. Um, these often escalated in a large scale when, when they're committed against Jewish people in Europe, we call them pogroms, and they were like pogroms here in the United States, like that of Tulsa, um, committed 100 years ago. Uh, next week is the big commemoration, so um, please pay attention to Tulsa next week. There are a lot of commemorations happening. When Black Wall Street was burned down, the community is recovered. It's a remarkable story, but a huge tragedy not known to many people in this country. And it happened to everybody, sharecroppers, ministers, community leaders, pregnant women, didn't matter. Um, and, you know, when I was in school, I learned about the Great Migration. It was great only in the sense of its scale, uh, but what we're really talking about here is 6 million Black American refugees fleeing the American South. And EJI in their reports, they said the condition of these people when they arrived in Northern states, they resembled more like refugees or internally displaced persons fleeing famine, war, or genocide in places that we see today, Syria and so forth, or those arriving at our southern border in the United States. And after the era of racial terror lynching came, sundowning smaller cities and towns, driving 
black populations out of town, burning houses down, threatening violence into urban ghettos. So how do people, you know, I always wondered why were there no, you know, black people in my town? I could count the number of black kids I went to school with on one hand. Um, and I just assumed that black people never settled there. But in fact, black people were settling there since 1840 and were driven out of town through policies and so forth. So how did the racial terror lynching come to an end? Uh, it became infused with the justice system. Um, so uh, they mollified these mobs who wanted to lynch people by having public executions carried out by the state. And uh, when we look at the way mass incarceration has developed in the United States, the assignment of criminality and dangerousness to African-Americans, this goes back to the mural I showed. Um, these are all legacies of mass atrocity, which have not been addressed as such in this country. And I didn't post it in this presentation, um, but if you read the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, um, you can go down the list of the criteria and say, yes, this happened to black people in America. Yes, this happened to black people in America. Yes, this is still happening to black people in America. You know, the use of the term genocide is loaded um, and is sometimes more harmful than it is helpful. But I think we need to recognize that that is the magnitude and pervasiveness of the problem and the legacy we are dealing with in this country. So when we think about why this happened to George Floyd, when we think about why this happened to Ahmed Arbery, all these other people, it's because we're living out the effects of mass atrocity against black Americans uh, that has never been sufficiently resolved. And here um, we have one of my heroes, Brian Stevenson, who said, the great evil of American slavery wasn't involuntary servitude. It was the ideology of white supremacy in which people persuaded themselves that black people aren't fully human. When you look at the 13th Amendment, which talks about ending forced labor, it says nothing about ending this narrative of racial differences. Slavery didn't end in 1865, it just evolved. Um, and so Equal Justice Initiative calls for um, a national commitment to an ideology of equality, which has happened in Rwanda after the genocide in 1994. It happened in Germany after the Holocaust. It's never happened here. We've never had that commitment. Um, so it also, um, Vanessa, let me just pause. Do we have questions there? <clears throat> I, I think we have some comments and I can wrap them up at the end, but I, I you know, I would continue. Um, okay. Nothing burning. Good, good. Um, well, I, I want to get to the end. And Vanessa, you had kindly suggested that maybe we could go a little bit over if people are willing to stick around. Is that still the case? Still okay. the case. And of course, absolutely. Okay. And if and if anybody has to leave, you're not going to hurt my feelings. I probably won't even know because I'm looking at the slides. But you can also feel free to start um, adding your comments to the the chat bar and so forth. Um, but uh, the reason that this problem and where I'm focused on the problem is the lack of acknowledgement of these incidents. Um, this is what we see in the small Jewish towns, the small town um, Poland, the, the remnants of Jewish life. Uh, you know, I've also seen it in Romania. You'll stumble upon a cemetery that's totally disheveled. Nobody's caring for. You'll see synagogues which have become bars and hotels. Um, and there are people who grow up in small towns in Poland that never knew Jewish people lived there, even though they were you know, in some cases, 40 or 50 or 60% of the population in a particular place. Um, this is what Michael Berenbaum, the, the rabbi, the eminent Holocaust scholar calls the absence of presence uh, and bringing presence to the absence. Um, and he said, uh, when, when we were together at, um, in uh, Krakow at, uh, for the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, he spoke at the JCC and he said, here in Poland, the only way to live with integrity in this land is to reveal that which has been concealed and to make visible the invisible. And as a white person here in America where these things happened, I take that as my charge. The only way to live with integrity in this land is to reveal that which has been concealed. Um, Vanessa, I saw you come off mute. Did you have something? Yeah. Um... Oh, Rabbi was wondering, um, do you know about the Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee? I do know about the uh, America's Black Holocaust Museum uh, was founded by a man named James Cameron, who was the um, survivor of uh, the last attempted lynching in a northern state. I think it was 1930. This happened all the way to 1930, maybe it was 1937 even. 
um, but he was apprehended with uh, two of his peers for the alleged rape of a white woman. Um, he escaped from the noose. Wow. Uh, the other two did die uh, after they were taken from their jail cell. He was a teenager and he went on to become the director of the first director of the Civil Rights Commission in the state of Indiana in the 1940s, going around uh, bringing attention to civil rights and human rights abuses um, in a segregated state. He moved to Milwaukee and founded America's Black Holocaust Museum, focusing on this problem. And I think, you know, there, there are a lot of people in my field, the field of Holocaust memory, who really get their hackles up about the use of the term Holocaust um, for good reason. And that's justified. And I can't argue with that. But I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to fight with people if we look at their purpose, I think it's more of an opportunity for conversation and allyship than it is for enmity. Um, so there, the America's Black Holocaust Museum was closed for a time, it's relaunching. Um, and I think it might have been ready to open its doors when the pandemic hit. But, um, you know, what we're talking about here, how do we change this problem of the lack of acknowledgement? We're talking about concretizing it with monuments and memorials. So in Europe, what do they have? Stolpersteine. These are small black, uh, brack, sorry, brass plaques that are uh, installed outside the last uh, known place of residence of choice for Jewish people who were arrested and deported and killed in concentration camps or, or otherwise. Um, so these, for example, are Stolpersteine that we installed in the town of um, Ports in Romania, Transylvania for um, the lady that I used to work with, Eva Moses Kor. Uh, and Stolpersteine literally means stumbling stone. So you're walking along and the idea is that you stumble over them a little bit, not so that you get hurt, but so you look down and notice, here's this bank. And before it was a bank, Jewish people lived here. What happened to the Jewish people? It says on the plaques. Um, so Equal Justice Initiative, the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, here's how they're trying to change the landscape in the United States by installing these visible markers for victims of racial terror lynching. Uh, and this is at the memorial site. It's profound. I would encourage anybody to go to Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and if you are on the fence on this issue at all, when you see the exhibit, go through the museum and go through the, the memorial. I, I will give you a lot of money if you are not sold on this issue by the end of it and the case that Brian Stevenson and the curators make there. Um, so what these are, are metal uh, obelisks, I guess you would say maybe, um, that have the name of a victim of racial terror lynching where and when it happened. And they've got uh, duplicate versions laid out for every community in America where this happened to come and claim their memorial and undergo a truth and reconciliation process in their communities and install these memorial markers. Um, so we're getting uh, close to the end of our time. I've got some more of the history to go through. Vanessa, I'm looking for you for guidance. Should we pause or should we keep going? Keep going. All right, I'll just take a drink. Uh, well, well, quickly, I, I just, I can't take my eyes off. Okay. Um, so why should we talk about this? There are a lot of people who say, oh, this is, you know, we need to heal, unity, unity. Why should we be talking about these ugly and divisive topics? Why can't we just move on? Well, first of all, I wanna acknowledge that we talk about the Holocaust all the time. We have a national museum, in fact, established on our national mall, dedicated to the Holocaust, even though it occurred in Europe to Europeans. Um, and also people love true crime on Netflix and podcasts and stuff like that. So it's not that we're averse to talking about ugly and violent things. Uh, it's just that the legacy of racialized violence uh, is about sheltering people from the truth in a lot of ways and the ramifications of that truth. So reasons for this are healing. Um, there's a culture of trauma and shame that surrounds these sorts of things. Uh, it, in people who survive mass violence and people who are close to it, it leads to insecurity, mistrust, and disconnection. And we talk about having a healthy society. How can we have that when you have so many disaffected, disenfranchised people? Um, when we're talking about black people, there are a lot of people who like to talk about black on black crime and the problems of the black family, you know, the disintegration of the black family. Well, why is that? A lot of it has to do with because so many black men are incarcerated. <laughs> and a lot of it has to do with so many black families are traumatized from these acts of violence, both, you know, great and small um, that happen on a near daily basis. 
Um, and when we think about uh, you know, black on black crime, so to speak, um, there's a, a psychologist who works with prison populations, James Gilligan, and he says all violence is an attempt to replace shame with self-esteem. Um, it provides a link to people who've also experienced this and allows for, for healing and people to move on. I would also note that this also harms the white community and everybody who observes it. Children are socialized with these sorts of violence. Um, you know, we have kids running around shooting each other with guns and that's all normal. That's, I mean, I'm, I did it too. I don't think it's really normal though. Uh, and I don't think it's, it's healthy. Um, you know, the, the role-playing games and, and video games and stuff like that, we can talk about that a lot, but I think those are all indicators of a sick society in a lot of ways. Um, and it reduces empathy in the perpetrators and bystanders, leads to mistrust of institutions. And as Michael Berenbaum says, I continually go back to his wisdom. He says, the best way to honor the pain, suffering, and death is to reinvest in life. Um, it also helps us draw a more accurate picture of what happened in this country because sure we have some monuments dedicated to Martin Luther King, civil rights heroes and stuff like that, but that's only one half of the picture. There are almost no monuments or memorials commemorating the suffering of black Americans. Um, and yet we have all these memorials in the South, particularly monuments to the architects of slavery and white supremacists, 59 of them alone in Montgomery, Alabama, where Equal Justice Initiative is. And it's not like these were built in, you know, 1850 and they're important pieces of history that we need to keep up. These, a lot of these were built in the last 60 years as a reaction to calls for more equality. Um, and we have, you know, these other forms of resurgent hatred anti-Semitism, you know, for Jewish people, in my view, for Jewish people to effectively address anti-Semitism. Jewish people are a very, very small minority, right? For, to build a powerful response to anti-Semitism, Jewish people need allies. And black people in America are a natural ally because they too are victims of violence, persecution, segregation, and so forth. But so much of racism, anti-Semitism, it's seen as a competition rather than an opportunity for common ground and, and mutual support. Um, and it helps, these sorts of memorials help us inoculate society. Um, so Berenbaum again, he says, we tell these stories not to dwell on the suffering, but to enlarge the sense of dignity and responsibility in those who encountered that which has been memorialized. Um, now we're in a time of crisis and polarization when all the fault lines are being activated. Um, and manipulated. Uh, and we see how white supremacy has been normalized and mainstreamed in ways that are unthinkable. We see people with Nazi tattoos, swastikas at rallies and stuff like that. And it's so pervasive now that part of me, I see it in a, in a news story and I'm like, ah, it happened again, moving on, you know, continue scrolling Facebook, whatever. It's so pervasive now. Um, and we've gone from this idea with the media manipulation and mob mentality of in the era of lynching, it was many people killing one, and now we have one people killing many in these mass shootings because people act more boldly in groups uh, than they do as individuals, and they act more boldly on, online where they're anonymous than they do in person. So this is the source of a lot of the harassment and so forth. So remembrance culture is about upholding uh, social norms that help prevent these sorts of things. It's about countering supremacies and denialism. As Brian Stevenson said, slavery didn't end, it just evolved. Um, and denial is a tool in the toolbox of supremacy and domination. Iris Chang, in response to uh, the Nanjing massacre, genocide in China, um, she said, the last stage of genocide, which enables the next act of genocide is denial. And we see denialism here in America before, during, and after these crimes in active and passive forms through the rhetoric and so forth. Um, remembrance is a form of truth telling and reconciliation and it provides a forum for people to work out their differences. It allows us to have mature conversations with the involvement of scholars who really know the history, have mature conversations about complicated things and reset society with a set of shared values and commitment to equality. Um, rebuilding trust in the institutions and so forth. So I've got some stuff about um, equal justice initiatives, community remembrance projects, and what it's all about is replacing the ideology of supremacy in all its forms with the ideology of equality, revealing that which has been concealed and bringing presence to the absence. So this is one of the projects I've been involved. This is Terry Ward, the great grandson of George Ward. Um, this is where we did a soil collection at the site where Ward was killed. 
um, and we uh, put them in these jars, sent them to the Vigo County Historical Society Equal Justice Initiative Museum uh, in Montgomery and one to the Ward family. So um, I've got here just a few thoughts on uh, navigating allyship, but I'll only do it if Vanessa tells me it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> I, okay, good. Yeah, we, it's just like, uh, you know, the ending. We have to see the ending. Okay, good. Um, so one thing that I've learned, maybe you heard this from Carl Wilkins when he spoke to this group, uh, a restorative justice approach, I think is really helpful. Um, and restorative justice is all about healing rather than blame. Accountability is part of it. Sometimes punishment can even be part of it. But the end goal is healing, not necessarily blame. Um, and that means building, sustaining, and repairing relationships is of the utmost importance. It means trying to include a multitude of voices and perspectives and taking most importantly, the experiences and perspectives of those people who are impacted most. And I've got a little graphic here showing who's impacted most. If you have any questions about it, right here in the middle are those who have suffered it, the victims and survivors. And one rung out, it's their loved ones and descendants. Um, and one rung out from that, it's people who are of that same identity, vulnerable and minority populations who are also targeted. And one rung beyond that, it's the frontline activists who are trying to do something about the problem with the least resources. So that's who we should focus on. Um, this man is Kandwani Fidel. He's, uh, I guess I would say, a survivor of um, violence in Baltimore's inner cities. He's a poet. Uh, he's an amazing speaker. Um, who's worked on some of the events I've helped produce in the past. And I just had an event with him in January where he defined for the audience liberation and allyship. In liberation, he said, is um, being able to tell your own story, history from your point of view. And when we see coverage of George Floyd, what happened to George Floyd, people speak about George Floyd and they don't know anything about him. Um, and a lot of inferences are made about these people uh, and they can't tell their own stories. And that's part of the problem here. Liberation means um, being able to tell your own story. Sorry, my, I need to plug in my laptop here. Here, I thought I was plugged in the whole time. Um, and he said, what is allyship? Allyship is recognizing where you have privilege and leveraging that privilege on behalf of in solidarity with people who are suffering and oppressed. So for me, allyship is recognizing where you're fortunate, that saying where but for the grace of God go I, recognizing what role you're playing by default and what role you could be playing and leveraging that as your commitment to remedy, repair and healing. Um, you know, we all are under a lot of stress these days. And I wanna acknowledge, you know, the amount of stress that's happening to all of our families and communities with, um, Israel and Gaza. Uh, and so it's just about doing the best we can. Progress is better than perfection. Learn more to become more skilled, do more to build more trust. And most of that I'm finding is giving time and follow through, keeping up on relationships. You know, like this, this group memorialize the movement that I'm working with. They're not paying me. I'm not asking to be paid. I'm just giving them time to help build capacity for them to keep doing their thing. And as a white person, I feel like that's my role to help. Um, those relationships of trust, they can help insulate from the effects of cancel culture. So if people wanna cancel me because I made a misstep on social media or something like that, I'm gonna be insulated that, from that because I know that I have people that I've worked with, black people who will have my back and know that I did right by them. Um, so having those relationships helps. Thinking about the default processes in your workplace or organization is important. And there's a there's a good document called White Supremacy Culture, um, which I can I can help circulate. Vanessa, I can send you a bunch of stuff if the group is interested afterwards. Um, it means taking responsibility and a lot of times outwardly. Uh, you know, for me, it's a challenge always because I'm inclined to be a bridge builder and I don't want to push people off the boat by saying something too divisive. The challenge for me is being more and more bold in my advocacy. Um, and along the way, being committed to growth and learning, making mistakes, uh, you know, not packing up and going home in your advocacy just because people criticized you or something like that. 
being sturdy and trying to do the right thing. And that involves vulnerability. When I step into a black lead space, I know I'm opening myself up for inspection and criticism, but I'm there to do the right thing because I believe it's the right thing and I can take it. Um, and I just want to close with this uh, inscription in the beginning of Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. I don't know if anybody's read that book, um, but that's a powerful one. And uh, it's got a quote from James Baldwin here. I think these two quotes are at odds with each other. I think there's a tension be between the two and I think they're both true. And James Baldwin said, because even if I should speak, no one would believe me. And they would not believe me pre precisely because they would know that what I said was true. Albert Einstein, on the other hand, said, if the majority knew of the root of this evil, then the road to its cure would not be long. And that's where I am. I believe that with more historical acknowledgement and recognition than more of my white colleagues, my white family members and friends and network, they would understand how really devastating the history of, of racism and segregation and so forth has been in America. And if they knew that, then they would immediately wanna be engaged in the solution. So for me, my answer is trying to help more people become more aware of this uh, as a way of addressing the problem. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to speak. I'm open to any questions. I'll stick around as long as uh, you'd like. Uh, well, you have certainly succeeded in your, um, you know, in your mission today because we are all more enlightened and there's great questions and compliments in the chat. You should go look. Um, I have um, one question. Um, do you have any insights on the Asian directed hate crimes and violence in the pandemic COVID era? Um, yes, uh, I know there's a lot of uh, great organizations, you know, as always, when I think about what is the root of the problem and who has the answers, whoever is closest to the problem always has some answers and we can start there. Um, so uh, Committee of 100, for example, I think is a, a great organization to look for some of those answers. Um, and for me, it's, it's about uh, the golden rule of allyship, which is to advocate for others as you would have them advocate for you. Because although I'm in an empowered and privileged position, that may not always be the case. And if somehow the tables turn and people are coming for me, I'm going to want others to have my back. And so I want to be advocating for Asians, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders. I want Jewish people to be advocating. I want to constantly be building that, that coalition. So I'm really ad addressing that question in a roundabout problem, but it's, it's urgent and needs to be addressed. And equality and security should not be seen as a zero sum game. We shouldn't say they're getting the attention and that's a problem for us because we're not getting the attention. We should all advocate together. Yeah. Uh, Karen, go ahead. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, so I toss and turn internally like a lot about the complexities of oppressed communities walking together. Um, because there's so much trauma and pain and dysfunction that sometimes comes out towards each other. And that's the result of trauma, right? Um, and it's really painful, um, but it's also something that I think is necessary to walk together. And so that's just a vague statement, but I was just wondering if it's something that you have thought about or talked on about navigating those spaces when you're seeing, you know, and I'll be specific, Jews and, you know, Black Americans um, really struggling to hear each other without hurting each other. Um, and I know for me, what, what the struggle is knowing when to speak up and knowing when to step back when it comes to anti-Semitism, right? And there's just so much trauma and it's just really hard for me to know, like, should I say something? because it's important to recognize that anti-Semitism is real or should I be quiet because there's trauma coming out from the other end. And that's just, I don't, I'm not asking for you like solve for that. I just, it's something I'm struggling with a lot and I see it happening this week um, with so much division. Um, there's a post going around on social media about, you know, if you posted a black square a year ago, why aren't you posting a blue square, right? And 
you know, it's just like, I, 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 I get that. And it totally actually did move me to think about some internalized stuff, but it also makes me feel like, why are we saying we're against each other? Right. So I'm rambling, but I'm just wondering if it's something you ever speak on in terms of like the complexities of our communities taking out trauma on each other. And, and how do we kind of respect that? Cause I ultimately think yeah. that's the most important work. Wow. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you, Karen. And um, it's not only about, uh, yeah, like um, traumas uh, and, um, you know, how, how that gets in the way, but also our own exhaustion and lack of inner resources as we're dealing with all these things, you know, like I'm sometimes I don't change. Well, first of all, I never change my profile picture for like, you know, the, the current cause that's going on because part of it is I don't want to be accused of like, oh, you changed your square for this, but not for that. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I've seen like my trans friends online saying, you know, kind of like vague booking, if you will, like, I see everybody talking about this problem and that problem, but nobody's talking about the wave of anti-trans bills going around, you know, state legislatures and so forth. And yeah, of course I want to talk about it. I, I want to, but like, you know, sometimes you just don't have the inner resources to do everything um, and to keep up. We, none of us can keep up with all the causes. Like I live and breathe, you know, this is my work where, where my work is um, and I can't even keep up with all of it. Um, so that's just an aside, but uh, yeah, I think that our response to trauma just needs to be so much more pervasive in so society. Um, you know, the, the acknowledgement of the role of trauma and even the existence of intergenerational trauma is something that's only come about very recently. Mm -hmm. And all of the ways, uh, I've, I've seen this play out a number of times in activism, that a lot of the people who become involved in activism are the ones who are the most traumatized and who are the most ill-prepared internally to be leading people and keeping people all together in the same boat. Mm -hmm. um, and God bless them for wanting to do the work but they need help. We need help. I need help. You know, you probably need help. Um, and so if, if we just had, it's, you know, a greater acknowledgement of the need for mental health resources from an earlier age and in a more robust way, then we'd be more prepared to deal with that perhaps. Um, but that's, you know, that's a systemic thing. I think Karen, a lot of times, um, I guess my response would be to, to break it down to an atomized level. And a lot of the problems come about when we get higher and higher up in our levels of generalization in the discourse. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're trying to build trust, uh, you know, we want to have big public get togethers and, and, and convenings and stuff like that. But sometimes you got to start behind closed doors and that's where trust is built. And sometimes you got to start with a one-on-one -on -one meeting. And I'm thinking about, um, you know, I'm looking at Danny Spungen here on my screen uh, you know, Danny and I have worked with a guy named Lewis Lee, who's a frontline activist in the Amani neighborhood of Milwaukee, one of the most incarcerated neighborhoods uh, in the whole country um, per capita. And, uh, you know, Lewis is black. He grew up with all sorts of generalizations about Jewish people and Jewish wealth and all those sorts of things. And it wasn't until he met the Spungen family that he learned that Jewish people are, they can be everything that every other human can be and they can be your allies too. Um, so I think, uh, and I hear this as well from um, people who come from Syria and what they've learned in their schooling about people from Israel. And once you get a chance to interact with people personally, relationships of trust, it's just, it's an insulator. It's, it's a, you know, a certifier of bridges so they don't go up in flames as easily. Um, and I just think it takes a lot of, a lot of patience and grace with each other. Like just yesterday, I was at this event, this George Floyd exhibit that I was talking about. One of the speakers, of course, is talking about free Palestine and, you know, Israel, this and Israel, that. And I'm like, I'm not on board with this. I'm not on board with this, but I'm not going to say, screw you to this organization. I'm walking away. You've lost me because I want to be engaged in helping bring them along and, and meeting in common ground but I'm fortunate to have the resources where I can do that. Not everybody's there. And I guess I would just say, you know, before, if, if your resources are burning down to the very end, before you set fire to the bridge, just walk away first and go have a cup of coffee, play with your dog or whatever, and, and come revisit the bridge another day. 
super um, helpful. Yeah, <clears throat> and we, you mentioned Ime Nanili Mili, and um, I can't help but mention, because this is my um, area of expertise, that Hafta Lerayecha Kamocha, you should love your neighbor as yourself from Leviticus, from Kiddushim. And I think that's what we have to think about. We have to treat our neighbors as we want to be treated and keep them, uh, you know, look at our allyship. There's so much for us to do. Um, I, first of all, want to thank um, Kiel, fabulous, fabulous program this morning. Thank you, Jim Schuster, for bringing um, Kiel to us. We're already talking about, should we come to Minneapolis? Should we go uh, down to, Ma you know, where should we, what's our first trip um, on the way to a uh, civil, uh, civil rights field trip? So I thank everyone. Uh, and it was just a fabulous morning, which gave us a lot to think about. So thank you, Kiel. Thank you, Jim. Good to see everybody. Thank you again for the opportunity and thank you everyone for being open to what I had to say. Happy to circulate more resources. Vanessa, you can feel free to circulate my email address and all that sort of thing. Right. Send that to me and I'll get it out to everybody. All okay, right. We'll do. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.